bring on our guest, Donald Johansson. Um, and Donald, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I've got a little introduction of uh, Donald. Uh, for the past 40 years, Donald Johansson has conducted field and laboratory research in paleoanthropology. Most notably, he discovered the 3.18 million year old homin hominid skeleton popularly known as Lucy through grants from the National Science Foundation, the LSB Leakey Foundation, and the National Geographic Society. Johansson has carried out field research in Ethiopia, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and Tanzania. He is an honorary member of the Explorers Club, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, a member of many other professional organizations, and a recipient of several international prizes and awards. He has written, among other books, The Widely Read Lucy, The Beginnings of Humankind, and numerous scientific and popular articles. In 1994, he co-wrote Ancestors in Search of Human Origins and narrated a companion Nova television series seen by more than 100 million people worldwide. Johansson is a frequent lecturer at the university and other forums in the United States and abroad. And uh, Mr. Johansson, thank you so much for joining us today and we really appreciate having you. If you'd like to uh, go ahead and share your screen, um, you should be able to do so and start your presentation. Well, before I start my presentation, uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone and thank all of you down there in Tucson, especially the folks associated with this uh, learning program. Uh, it's been a joy getting this thing all set up without any problems. Uh, and you mentioned all the places that I've uh, I've been and traveled to and done research, and uh, I guess I thank my lucky stars that I did that before COVID decided to make an appearance. And you can well imagine that many of us in the field of anthropology, especially your excellent anthropology department uh, down in Tucson, uh, we're all frustrated that we can't get to the field uh, and continue with our research. And in some cases, we even can't travel to museums where these original specimens all reside. So this, uh, this fall, uh, actually beginning in the summer, uh, the Institute of Human Origins, where uh, I work at uh, Arizona State University, we have also been doing a number of Zoom calls uh, around the world and uh, finding this an interesting new opportunity for us to be able to share the results uh, of the work that we've been doing and uh, a little bit about where we're going with our research. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, open this presentation and run it. Here we are. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be really uh, relating to you today the story of Lucy, why she has been so important and what I mean by that her species which we'll learn about Australopithecus afarensis so important in our vision of the earliest stages of what I like to call the human career uh, when our ancestors were really just a little bit more than the ape that stood up that takes us back to four or five and now six million years ago and why Lucy sitting at around 3.2 million years is about the halfway point, which gives us a very interesting understanding of, of what was going on with early uh, hominin evolution. Uh, I've included my information here for those of you who might have an interest in sending a specific email, or if you'd like to uh, go to the uh, iho.asu.edu, you'll see uh, much more about the Institute of Human Origins, which I founded way back in 1981 and was acquired by ASU in 1997. We have some 17 scientists now associated with the Institute who are doing work in terms of paleontology, in terms of modern human behaviors, in terms of uh, genetics and so on. And uh, it's a little bit of a teaser that they sent you. Um, that is to say, connecting the human past to the global future. Uh, we are obviously uh, studying the past, 
the origins of humankind and uh, looking for aspects of that research that might have some bearing on a number of issues. One is uh, what makes us human. Uh, secondly, uh, how did all of that happen? What was the process? Uh, and what lessons can we learn from the past that might tell us something about what we should be doing now to uh, ensure a long and lively future for this incredible species, Homo sapiens. Uh, this theme connecting the human past to the global future is a interdisciplinary science and technology building um, moniker. This is a building that is being built as we speak uh, in Tempe uh, on the ASU campus. It will be the uh, entry building to the campus uh, right at a rapid transit stop and so on. There'll be uh, four floors. And uh, what we mean by connecting the human past to the global future is that we're the past. We'll be down here up on the second floor overlooking this large atrium. It'll be uh, a zero energy building. And um, we will be interacting specifically with the Wrigley School of Sustainability. Uh, you, as you probably know, many universities, particularly ASU under our president, Michael Crow, has stressed the synergy of interdisciplinary research and uh, paleoanthropology. Uh, talking to someone the other day, they thought that was a study of old anthropologists, but it's a study of our origins that the study of paleoanthropology is in itself interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and international in its scope. So we integrate geologists, biologists and anthropologists to um, seek answers to the various questions we pose. And the one thing that we uh, are excited about is that we will be interacting with a, a, a center, the Wrigley Center, the Wrigley School of uh, Sustainability in a way that would not have been possible uh, being separated in different buildings in different parts of the campus. So that this building will house uh, these two institutes as well as an institute of uh, innovation. And on the ground floor, what we're looking at here in the lower right hand corner, there will be display areas, classrooms and um, lecture halls. So we're looking forward to this. It's a forecast really. It will open in January, 2022. I'm sure that some of you will hear about it and maybe even come up and participate in those celebrations. Now, sorry. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of sort of at least the broad outlines of what the last sort of 6 million years looks like. We know from uh, genetic studies of uh, between humans and African apes that we certainly shared a common ancestor, obviously. And that common ancestor was probably lurking around in Africa some seven to eight million years ago. There are fossils that go back, as you will learn, to about six million years. They're sketchy. Uh, but at that time, already our ancestors were apparently walking upright. Not everybody agrees, but there is, I think, conclusive evidence that they were already walking upright. This is long before we began to make and use tools. It's long before we began to expand our brains. So in the past, you have something like this more ape-like looking creature on the left, which is a, this is actually a reconstruction of what uh, Lucy's boyfriend might have looked like, um, Australopithecus uh, and Homo erectus, which we now know also exists in Africa, but we think of in terms of Homo of uh, Peking and Java man, for example, and then the emergence of ourselves. And the major differences you see between Homo sapiens on the right and the others is that we have a very large cranial capacity, a very diminished face, it's not projecting, it's not ape-like. And uh, so we have these broad um, strokes of this campus, of this um, <laughs> canvas, uh, which shows us that there has been an interesting set 
of steps along the way. Uh, we now know, for example, that Homo sapiens goes back to some 300,000 years uh, from finds in Morocco and elsewhere. But there are still lots of gaps that we would like to fill in. Now, Charles Darwin, well known, I'm sure to all of you, uh, was one of the great innovators. He was one of the great he, scientists who really changed the paradigm and in the strict sense of a major shift in everything that was thought before. And that's the proper use of the word paradigm. We use it very loosely, but when uh, Kuhn wrote in his Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, that when there's a complete reversal, like the earth is not the center of the universe. It is not the center of the solar system. Uh, that thinking was a, a, a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift that Darwin brought about in his origin of species was a major paradigm shift in terms of how we understand the natural world. Uh, ultimately embraced by scientists like Dobzhansky who said, all species are unique, but humans are the uniquest of them all. And he also said that nothing makes sense in the biological world except in the framework of evolution. Now, Darwin was very reluctant, as you probably know, to say anything about human origins. He was really not interested in, in, in saying very much at the time in the uh, atmosphere of Victorian England. He didn't want to upset his wife, Emma, uh, who was a very religious person. And so what did he say in his book that sort of upset everybody? Well, the only thing he said was, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. That was in the last page of his book. And then he got a little more adventurous in the last edition of the origin when he said, much light will be thrown on the origins of man and his history. That's a little bit unfair because Darwin in uh, later books uh, really articulated scenarios for human evolution and human origins. And he and Thomas Henry Huxley suggested, of course, that Africa would be the place where we would find our most ancient and most primitive more ape-like ancestors. He wrote, it is somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. We now know that they behave a lot like us through the work of primatologists particularly, but not exclusively Jane Goodall. The more and more we learn about these creatures, we see that they share many of the same emotions that we do, that they live in fairly complex worlds, uh, that they have intense bonds between one another and so on. And of course, the genetic research that has revealed the fact that we are some 99% identical in our DNA with chimpanzees. And when Huxley and Darwin made that prognostication way back in the mid and latter part of the uh, 19th century, there were no fossils. Um, and uh, except uh, some Neanderthals that had been found in 1856, but nothing had been found in Africa. Uh, and now, as I said, there's absolutely no doubt that these two species, these two genera, Pantroglodytes, the chimpanzee, and Homo sapiens on the right, I had a good haircut in those days, which I sorely need now, um, share this common ancestry. This was an idea that I learned about when I was 13 years old, when I read Thomas Henry Huxley's book, Man's Place in Nature, and it was the moment of clarification for me. I found that idea so incredibly fascinating, so interesting, that uh, I began reading more and more. And I had a mentor who was a German anthropologist, or an anthropologist of German ancestry. And he had a vast library. And I began reading and I decided in high school that this is really what I wanted to do, to go to Africa and look for fossils. Whoops, why are we going back to that one? Well, let's go to Africa because this is where uh, Darwin and Huxley uh, and others suggested uh, that we would find our earliest ancestors. And of course, 
when discoveries were made in Africa uh, in 1925, uh, this what is called the Tong baby or uh, the Tong child, which was named this tongue twister Australopithecus africanus, published in February 1925. It was actually really discovered in 1924. But um, this was a bombshell. Uh, this was a total game changer. This was something that um, not only uh, justified and, sh and showed clearly that the pro prognostication of the 19th century natural history, history people were correct, but it also shifted very dramatically the spotlight from Europe. We had already in Europe at this point, what the French called Cro-Magnon, or Cro-Magnon man. We had the rock art paintings, we had Neanderthals, uh, and Europe was always thought of as the finishing school for humanity. Uh, people were saying, you know, nothing much happens in Africa. Uh, well, without Africa, we wouldn't be here today. So I would say a pretty important event occurred in Africa. Raymond Dart was an anatomist at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And uh, he stunned the biological world by saying, this is a specimen of a child, probably died around three years old. But there were certain features, particularly in the uh, posterior part of the brain and other things that suggested to him that this would have grown up into an upright walking creature, particularly because the hole at the bottom of the skull, the foramen magnum, the big hole where the spinal cord comes out was not facing backwards, but facing downwards. So this, this was a, a remarkable test. You know, people talk about, well, how do paleontologists, how do people who are not in white coats in laboratories who can mix things together, test things. Well, we pose a hypothesis and we look for um, things like this that would test that hypothesis, whether they would prove it or disprove it. And the oldest human fossils uh, continue to be found in Africa. Uh, in 1959, I was 16 years old and uh, the late uh, Mary and Louis Leakey working in northern Tanzania, just on the edge of the Serengeti, a very beautiful, romantic sort of place at Olduvai Gorge, recovered this cranium, uh, which is variously known as Nutcracker Man or Zinjanthropus or Deer Boy or whatever. But it was the first really well dated fossil. The geologists studied these strata. They saw that it was obviously associated with extinct species of animals, but also uh, they found a geological horizon, a geological layer of volcanic ash. And uh, geologists at the University of California at Berkeley were, were developing a method along with others known as argon dating and they found out that the stratum from which this came was probably about 1.8 million years in age. So this now shifted attention from Southern Africa to Eastern Africa, to probably some of the most beautiful landscape in the world, to the Great Rift Valley, which you see here, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, this is a, a line, uh, a scar on the face of the earth actually, that is one of the great geological um, developments on the planet. And it's a wonderful place to go. It's an enormous, like a giant Grand Canyon. It starts down here in Mozambique and continues northwards, as you can see all the way north here to this large triangular area where we will be focusing our attention shortly. But it's along this Eastern branch Here's the Western branch, but the Eastern branch has been produced by the Horn of Africa moving away from the hard core of Africa. The hard core of Africa has been pretty much stable for something like 500 million years. Uh, so this was a, co a continent of great stability. One must think about that. One must also think that it is a longitudinal country. It's not horizontal. So it's not latitudinal, which means that there are a vast number of different kinds of environments from deserts in the north to 
tropical rainforest through the equator down to more deserts in the south and so on. So it was an area that was also very rich in the Miocene, say pre eight to 10 million years ago. It was very rich in tens of species of apes, not just th two or three that we have today, you know, the bonobo, the chimpanzee and, and the gorillas. Uh, there were many different species of apes and they were all adapting in their own specific way. And evolution through the process of natural selection, as Darwin had suggested, was beginning to craft different species. And these were adapted to various environments. There was geological change, like the development of the Great Rift Valley. There was a growing drying in the uh, Pliocene and Pleistocene, uh, and so on, that isolated these various apes and allowed them to sort of evolve in their own evolutionary trajectories. So we had first a discovery here in Southern Africa of the Tong baby, and then the discovery here in Northern Tanzania, just here at the base of the Ngorongoro crater. I'll bet some of you have been to the Serengeti or to Northern Tanzania, I hope you have. Uh, and if you haven't, I would strongly suggest that you go on safari sometime and um, has progressed up through Southern Ethiopia where I first worked in 1970. So I guess I've been working there for almost 50 years, <laughs> long time. Uh, and up into the Afar, uh, up to Lake Turkana here, and then into uh, other places in the Great Rift Valley. Uh, Hadar uh, in the satellite photo, uh, this is roughly Ethiopia in here. I haven't put, put any country boundaries on this. This is Lake Turkana where uh, Richard Leakey, son of Lewis and Mary Leakey has been working since the 1960s and making uh, incredible discoveries there of our human ancestors, the capital of Addis Ababa. And as the rift continues, particularly because of this motion of the Horn of Africa, the Somali area, uh, it has vastly opened up the Great Rift Valley into something like 600 miles on a side. And this part of the Rift Valley was really ignored until the 1960s, the late 1960s, when a French colleague of mine began to explore what was truly terra incognita. And he came back to Paris, where I first met him, and he was exuberant. And he said, you know, if you think you have the fossil in the Omo in the Omo in the Turkana area, you come to the to the Afar. And he invited me to come with him. And we spent in 1972 a survey along this Awash River. And the site that we focused on particularly was the site of Hadar, uh, which we're going to delve into in a little more detail. So here is a more recent uh, photograph, an absolutely remarkable photograph, um, which shows the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It shows the uh, topography of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Bab el Mandab right here, uh, the depression, the Afar, uh, the, the um, Rift Valley coming up here. It shows various cities with their lights and very clearly the Horn of Africa. And just that little white dot is exactly where we're going to be going to the site of Hadar, which is a local name of the Afar people. And this gives you a little different perspective. Well, in 1972, uh, in April, uh, this was the vista I saw. We camped on the edge of a plateau. Uh, we looked out across this vista, and I felt that this was truly the El Dorado of paleoanthropology. Everything about it was absolutely right for major discoveries. It went on for, as you see, to the horizon. These ancient lake and river deposits are very heavily dissected by erosion. And when you drive around to them, as we did the very next day, it was littered with fossils everywhere you looked, of every kind of animal you could imagine. Elephants, rhinos, pigs, monkeys, 
uh, all kinds of bobbins and antelopes, giraffes, uh, and so on, hippos in great abundance. So this was obviously the site of a very large lake. And we're learning a lot more about that lake, that it was moving, that it was drying up right after Lucy's species disappeared and moving further north. And I had a report from an institute scientist just recently that they're finding those sediments northeast of us that sample what happened after Hadar began to dry up, which is in enlarging enormously our understanding of, of the forces that crafted human origins. The other thing about it that was so wonderful is right along here, there's a green strip. That's a river. That's the riverine forest. That's the Awash River. So if we were to work there, there was a permanent source of water for us. And there are light horizons. We'll see them even better. These volcanic ashes here, which could be subjected to argon dating and help us develop a chronology for what was going on at Hadar as these deposits were deposited. We know that the pack of sediments there is a, a samples 400,000 years of time between 3.4 and 3 million years, which is extraordinary. And they are rich with fossils all the way through. So we decided we formed the International Law Fire Research Expedition and uh, began to work there. When we look at it from this perspective, you can see the Awash River right here. Um, and we're camped. I don't know how many of you who located our camp, but there it is. Uh, right adjacent to these fossil deposits that you see in the background. Uh, and you see these volcanic ashes right here that allowed us to outcrop over here also. And the Lucy site was over here somewhere in this area, about um, a 35 minute drive from camp. So we had a permanent source of water. This is what it looks like on the ground, uh, conveniently adjacent to fossil deposits. We set up a, a camp at Camp Hadar um, every, in the seventies, it was, um, every year beginning in 1972 and 73. Um, and today the expedition has grown to be much larger. Uh, this for example is the um, kitchen tent where all the food is made. We have upwards of 30 people in the field. We need a permanent source of water. We need a dedicated uh, kitchen staff. These are sleeping tents here and here and some others are hidden. You don't see them here. Uh, this is the dining tent. Uh, the more sleeping tents. And this is our work tent right here and our showers. So we have an incredibly dedicated group of people working there. The area is very remote, as you can see. It's dangerous, but fortunately we have some wonderful local people who now all carry AK-47s or Kalashnikovs, um, who we have known, um, many of them, such as this young man, uh, and uh, this young man we've known since they were practically infants. Uh, we knew their parents. Uh, people uh, like uh, Momen have been with the expedition ever since he was a, a young teenager. And they uh, not only participate in discovery, they look after us, as you can see, and guard us from wandering marauding lions, as well as a tribe across the river known as the Isa. These are Afar people. Uh, they're both Muslim tribes, but uh, they haven't always gotten along so well. And we're right on the boundary with the river. And uh, it's comforting to have these guys with us. And what's most, interest, most interesting to me about it is the incredible and intense interest that they have taken in the work. Very difficult for any of us, even myself, to think about what was what is 3.4 million years when we're trying to survive, you know, the next decade. Um, and they don't quite understand it any better than we do. But what they do understand is that the world looks at this area as vitally important for understanding the origins of humankind. And in their belief system, they have accommodated the view that Lucy was the first Afar. And therefore, all people on the planet are descended from her. 
we know that all of us, no matter where we live, have African genes in us because that's where our earliest progenitors lived, probably in Southern Africa, or but probably or perhaps also in Eastern Africa. So we have these folks to look after us. Uh, an expedition is, as I said, multinational, multi, multidisciplinary. Uh, these are the people who, with whom I would not be talking to you today, uh, who take two and a half months of, of a year in the, to spend out there under really challenging conditions to share that dream of trying to understand the earliest origins of humanity. Our camp is now, we started with kerosene lamps, you know, and being old fashioned, I miss those days. Um, but now we've got internet and, uh, and we've got electricity because of solar panels. It makes things a lot easier, I know. But I love those days when you left Addis Ababa and after two days you arrived here and you had virtually no contact with the outside world. You didn't care what was happening in Washington, D.C., for example. Um, you be, stopped listening to the BBC news in the evening and you just felt yourself immersed in the natural world that from which we were all created. But today we have electricity, as you can see, geologists working over here. This is the uh, dining tent. Dinner is just finished here. And uh, some people are still sitting talking about whatever subject they're working on and so on. That's the other thing. When you're there, you from dawn till dusk, till the from the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to bed, you're doing what you dream of doing. And that is an incredible reward. So how do we find these fossils? Well, um, you know, we just, there's no magic way. We don't have any technology that says, you know, dig here. We go out and we survey, like you see this. Here's a team of six people who are out surveying together and uh, looking for these fossils on the ground as they have eroded out of these strata where they've rested more or less in, 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 in um, uh, frozen time where they fall out onto the ground and they're almost reanimated once you pick them up. So, that's how we find them. Sometimes they're relatively easy to find. Uh, here you see the strata in the background and these are lake deposits. They're very fine grained. It's a deeper water out there. This was, this was probably very close to the edge of the lake at one point because you can see that this is an elephant foot eroding out of the ground. This is the ankle here. This is the top of the elephant foot. These are the little um, inside sort of foot bones, which are in that foot of an elephant. And it has been, the, the rock has been eroded away and it's now coming out of the ground uh, and probably where it fell and died 3.3 million years ago. Uh, at other times, uh, it's only a single tooth uh, that one might find that leads to an excavation like this. Um, and you see this molar, this upper molar, uh, that was found just down here where Bill Kimball, well, quite out of focus, but Bill Kimball, who's director of the Institute now, uh, and a geologist trying to figure out where we are in the stratigraphy. And after screening and collecting down this slope, we had most of a face of one of Lucy's species uh, because of the collection, the screening, and so on. And it takes a very keen eye to spot something that small. Well, this is uh, November 1974, uh, which was the first uh, major, well, second major expedition we had there. I was walking along this gully right here. I'd gone out in the morning. This is a little plateau, which is kind of set up above these lower areas. And we had gone out, a student and, my, and me, to this spot where we had found the previous year a stunningly beautiful, if you can say that, pig skull, uh, fossil pig skull. And we needed to mark the spot. Those were the days before GPS where we had 
topographic maps. We made our own maps. Aerial photos were not the best. Uh, and we had to plot that and leave a marker there, which we labeled. And taking time to search through this area, uh, there, was, there was very little bone. Found a couple of fragments of a baboon mandible, some antelope remains. But just as I came along here and turned to go back this way, which would meant going back down to my Land Rover and driving back to camp, I looked over my shoulder and uh, saw a fragment of bone that led to this skeleton. And there is a marker there today now, which is established by the Ethiopian government. It's written in the Afar language. It's written in Amharic. Amharic, Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that has its own special alphabet, and also in English, uh, commemorating that uh, specific spot. So what was it that caught my eye? What caught my eye was this little wrench-shaped bone. That's the bone that allows you to flex and extend at your, at your elbow, right? And uh, that is the elbow bone right there, right, right at the tip. And that's what you're looking at right here. And that little notch is where the upper arm bone, the humerus fits in. And I knew as I kneel down to look at that, that that did not come from a monkey, that did not come from an antelope. There was nothing else that could come from. And almost instantaneously, the shape of that bone clicked into what I was carrying in my subconscious from studying bones for so many years. And then we glanced up this slope and saw that there were pieces of skull, there were pieces of the backbone, uh, there was even a piece of hip, which very seldom ever preserves. And uh, the very next day we went out, just uh, the two of us, Tom uh, Gray, my former student, myself, much younger in those days, and um, began collecting and flagging exactly where these bones came from. We felt that we wanted to control it so people weren't stepping on bones. And then we spent uh, two and a half weeks collecting material at this site, uh, all of which was screened through a fine mesh screening and all the bone fragments saved. Those, what was left over on the ground were all put into burlap sacks. Those sacks were carried to the Land Rover, driven to the river, where uh, each and every bit of soil that had come from that site that we had scraped down was water washed through a very fine screen. And then in a very arduous and uh, demanding process, uh, at least two people would look through what remained in the screening so we wouldn't miss the tiniest chip of enamel or um, flake of bone. And that uh, has resulted in this uh, partial skeleton, uh, which we all call Lucy. This is Maurice Tayeb, the Frenchman. Uh, this is the first time we were putting this, this discovery together uh, in camp. She had not left camp. She had not left where she had, where she had died. Uh, and, and after existing in you know, anonymous uh, suspension for all of those years, here she was coming to light again. We hadn't cleaned the bones, there was still sandstone on it, so obviously she died at a lake's edge. Probably, perhaps, we don't know exactly why. Either she was taken by a crocodile, which is possible, there's one puncture mark in her pelvis, um, or whatever. But we do know that she was down there probably to get water, and there were turtle eggs and crocodile eggs in the same stratum where we found her. So certainly this was something they were including in their diet. Uh, much younger than the days of sideburns, some of you may remember. And um, it was uh, an extraordinary uh, expedition, an expedition which uh, resulted in this skeleton um, becoming really literally iconic, uh, probably the best known uh, fossil skeleton of a hominin in, uh, of the 20th century. Um, her name comes from Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, the Beatles song. I was playing a Beatles tape on my little tape recorder and a member of the expedition said, do you really think this is a female? And I said, the teeth are so small, 
the bones are so lightly built, this has to be a female. And she said, why don't you call it Lucy? And there was no going back. And then in 1978, four years later, we gave her that scientific moniker, Australopithecus, Afarensis after the Afar and the Afar people. And it was published as a unique new species. She was only about three and a half feet tall. Uh, if you look at the length of her thigh bone, uh, just down, look down at one of your thigh bones or put a ruler next to it. This was only 12 inches long. Uh, ours are much longer. Um, we know that she was an adult because she had her wisdom teeth erupted. The third molars were present and all the bone growth where bones grow along those growth plates was fused. We didn't know what that meant biologically. We now know from studies of the dentition particularly that they matured much more rapidly, more ape-like. And she was probably about 11 or 12 when she died, yet she was a young adult. Whether she had children, we don't know. Uh, also, when you compare the arm, the upper arm, it's almost the same length as the lower limb, the femur or thigh bone. Look at yours, how much longer your femur or thigh bone is than your uh, humerus. So, she had relatively short legs, probably a leftover from the time when they were using all four extremities for climbing around in trees or whatever. So, uh, and, and the hip, we have the tailbone, the, the, uh, here the left innominate or um, hip bone, we would call it. Uh, we have a knee and we have an ankle. And all of those regions so critical for our mode of locomotion, walking upright, are virtually identical to our own. The first publication I made on the fossil knee joint was with an orthopedic surgeon. And I brought it to him and he, you know, he looked at it and he said, well, it's identical to a human knee. It's the kind of things we put in when people have, I bet some of you have had a knee replacement, but it was much smaller but it had all the hallmarks. And I'm not gonna go into the details. I'm gonna talk all afternoon about just the knee, but there are slight nuances in that knee uh, that's 3.4 million years old from another individual that are identical to the ones that we carry in our skeletons today. Lucy became almost instantaneously popular. She's best known even in Ethiopia as Lucy. Here's a Lucy College, for example. There's a Lucy Bakery. The women's international soccer team is known as the Lucy team. There are political uh, publications called Lucy. Uh, and there are uh, all sorts of things named after her. Even a hotel now has been named after her. Um, and then even in our society, here's a Tazo uh, tea bag. It says, some say all human beings descended from a single African primate named Lucy. If it's true, she probably enjoyed taking a break from the kids with a soothing Tazo red bush tea. Well, so my favorite cartoon is a paleo cocktail party. And here you see she's being introduced and he's saying, oh, not the Lucy. But um, she needed an Ethiopian name. Uh, we, we, the Ministry of Culture sent several representatives to our field camp right after she was discovered. We sent a car out to uh, a town nearby that had, you know, one of those old telephones where they have to crank it and try to get a line to Addis Ababa, and they did. And the Ministry of Culture sent a few people, and they, one of them said, she needs an Ethiopian name. And I said, I agree. I said, but I don't know what to call her in Ethiopia. And he said, why don't we call her Dinkanesh, which is right here on this commemorative stamp. And Dinkanesh is an Amharic word, which means you are wonderful. You are beautiful. And indeed she is. Here's the entire skeletal reconstruction showing her upright. You see those very long arms relative to short legs. And the Afar people call her Helomeli, which means again, you are wonderful. Um, probably the greatest bit of controversy launched with her discovery was did they really walk fully upright? There were a cadre of, of scholars at uh, back east uh, 
at uh, Stony Brook University who said, you know, they, they walked around bent kneed and bent hipped. And uh, they weren't very, uh, very, you know, efficient upright walkers. My view and the view of my team of people who were working on this, we said they walk just like we do. They're not walking with a bent knee and a bent hip. And I mean, it was so obvious that why would natural selection have a creature, particularly males that were up to five feet in stature, uh, weighed up to 110 pounds. Lucy was only probably about 60 pounds. Um, I said, just go, next time you go shopping, when you get out of your car, walk bent knee, bent hipped all the way through the shopping and carrying the groceries out. You'd be so exhausted. The muscles were selected to be efficient in terms of keeping our bodies upright and having us locomote the way we do. We don't know exactly why we have become bipeds, why we aren't all walking around like all our closest relatives on all fours, but it certainly was an effective change with how many billion people on the planet today. So when Mary Leakey came up to visit my camp from Tanzania, um, she went back to a site known as Litoli in uh, 1975. And her team found this trail of human footprints and jaws that were identical to the jaws we were finding. So we knew it was the same species. Yet at Litoli, there was a volcanic eruption. This volcanic ash came out, blanketed the earth like a snow, uh, a snowfall. Uh, there was a light rain. This became very muddy or mushy. And at least two of Lucy's relatives walked across there and left their footprints at 3.7 million years ago. And that is identical. That footprint was left on that landscape by one of Lucy's species 3.7 million years ago. And it's identical to the footprints we leave on the beach as we walk barefoot with a strong heel strike. There's even a uh, arch to the foot, as you can see here, a very strong, great toe, which is used as a propulsive, not rather than a grasping foot, like a, a, a gorilla or a chimpanzee or a monkey that has a very divergent prehensile foot that looks like that for grasping. And uh, here was uh, the smoking gun, that there was no question that these ancestors were walking uh, upright. We had a hiatus in the 1980s because of the um, war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, the communist regime that was in charge of Ethiopia. It was a very uncomfortable, a very unsafe place to be. Uh, frustrated for all those years as we are now, not being able to go back. We did other work in places like Olduvai and other, other uh, important sites. And it allowed us to do something that we were, that all academics hate to do, and that is their homework. In other words, publishing. So we came up in 1990 when we returned to the site with a series of questions. Uh, it may come as a surprise to you that in, in 1981, when the research was interrupted, we knew that Lucy was older than 3 million, but we didn't know how much older than 3 million. We didn't have a precise date. So we targeted a particular layer here when we went back. This is a volcanic ash layer. It's 3.2 million and Lucy stratigraphically was found just above it. So that gave a very good geological date to her uh, as well as to other fossils that we had found before such as this or this 3.4 million year old knee joint that I mentioned just very briefly. Now, the other thing that we wanted to do was to uh, find complete skulls. We had no complete skulls. Uh, we then found a complete male skull and a complete female skull. And we found other areas that could be well dated, one here, one here, one here, and here, and one here. And what is interesting is we also discovered a disconformity that was a when that Lake Hadar had moved north and there was no deposition there. So that's why we weren't finding any fossils between about 2.9 and about 2.4 million years. There was 
you know, about 400,000 years of time missing. And it was missing because it, there was no lake there at that time. So we were able to develop a, a detailed understanding of what is called the Hadar formation, that Australopithecus, as you can see, ranges from, well, 3 million down to 3.4. We know from other sites like Lytoli that Afarensis went back to 3.7. So this was a long lived species. I mean, we've been around 300,000 years. We think that's a long time. But here they were around for almost 800,000 years, which meant that this was a fairly well adapted and or adaptable species, I should say, that adjusted to climate change uh, over a long period of time. And that is part of what we're trying to tease out of the fossil record now and try to understand the forces of climate on the anatomy and the persistence of this extraordinary species that lived in different habitats from more closed habitat, habitats like Hadar to more open habitats like Lytoli. And the other thing that uh, came as a huge surprise to us was the discovery of our own genus at Hadar. We never expected that. We never expected. And you see, that does not appear until Afarensis goes extinct. And I want to make a case from sort of here on out, what that means for Afarensis' role in understanding the origins of ourselves. Um, so here's this beautiful female skull. You know, people say, well, do you give all your fossils cute little names? No, we don't. We've never given the specimen a name. It was just serendipity that that Beatles tape was playing that night. But this is what Lucy's face would look like. And what is interesting about it is that this is this mandible here, the, the lower jaw, uh, is somewhat larger than Lucy's. So it, it showed us for the very first time that there was a variation from a, the smallest in size, Lucy, to some of the largest. And you'll see that just here. This is the male skull we found, much larger than a female. There was a sexual dimorphism. It's like if you go to the zoo and you look at baboons, or you go to Africa and look at baboons, you go to Africa and look at gorillas, you go to Africa, look at chimpanzees or orangs in Southeast Asia, males are much larger than females. This is called sexual dimorphism. And we could go into perhaps why that's so a little bit later. But now we had a good understanding of, of what uh, males and females look like. We also had a baby skull, uh, that told us something about uh, the growth patterns, uh, which I don't show here, and also my dear colleague, uh, an Ethiopian scholar. So fascinating. One of our goals in this whole endeavor was to train Ethiopian scholars. Why not? I mean, they're interested in this work. It's their country. It's like, think about us here in the Southwest, right? How would we feel if the French or the Germans came over here and dug up all our Native American sites and took everything back to Europe. You know, we're interested too. And uh, an Ethiopian student who is now a professor at the University of Chicago, where I got my PhD, um, was a postdoctoral candidate at ASU in the Institute. And we funded his expedition and he found a fairly complete baby skull, which you may have heard of known as the Dakika baby, which is about 3.3 million years old. And that allowed us to say something of the differences between mom and offspring. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, reconstruction done by a great friend of mine in Spain, who is a, a paleo artist who's uh, reconstructed many of the fossils and the environments. Uh, we were also very interested in really trying to understand what the environment in which Lucy lived looked like. Um, and it was al along the lake and away from the lake, much more forested like this. Here you see a male and a female Afarensis walking through another one by my friend Maurice Anton. Lucy is not alone. In 1975, we found a treasure trove of fossils uh, fragments of up to 17 different individuals who had died together. Young individuals, infants, males and females, a troop 
of Afarensis that all died at one time. Great mystery, unsolved. We don't know why they died, but we know they died together because they're in one stratum and they were buried together. They were moved around a little bit, but they didn't have chewing marks on them from carnivores. So they hadn't been favored by some hungry lion or leopard or um, hyena that had a taste for humans. Uh, and uh, they were buried very quickly because there are no scavenging tooth marks on it. So now we have over 500 specimens of Lucy's species from Hadar. We know they lived in multi-male, multi-female uh, groups that they had probably a very uh, wide uh, diet, everything from uh, fruits. And um, here you see them collecting fruits from a fig tree bird eggs, turtle eggs, et cetera, et cetera. But no really convincing evidence that they were including any significant amount of meat in their diet because there are no stone tools found with any Afarensis fossils. Well, as Pliny the Elder wrote, ex Africa sempre aliquid novi, and I know you all remember your Latin, always something new out of Africa. And I'm going to point out a couple of things. Some things have just been announced just this April. People say, well, you know, why do you keep these old fossils around? What more can you learn about them? Well, every time someone says that, some new development happens, like precise reconstructions in virtual space of these creatures, uh, measurements using uh, certain kinds of scanning methods that tell, let us go inside the skulls and see how what the shape of the semicircular canals are in the inner ear and so on. And this just came out um, in the spring. Uh, and what was done was the estimated uh, brain size. Uh, and here is one male skull from Hadar missing a face. Here's uh, another one. And here's the um, this is the female, this is the male, and this is an infant. Uh, oh, this is, this is Lucy herself. And it turns out that there is some increase in brain size. It's about a 20% increase in the average over chimpanzees. So already selection for a larger brain was underway. Uh, which is quite significant and something we really didn't have a good handle on. The other thing was, as I said, the discovery of our own genus Homo. And here is that upper jaw or maxilla that was found in 1994 uh, at Hadar associated with stone tools. Doesn't look very impressive, but all of you out there who know anything about archaeology see the little striking platform up here and the bulb of precaution, that was purposely made at the spot where we found it with all the other flakes by some individual that belonged in this genus, Homo, our own. We don't know how big the brain was, we don't have any. We don't know what species it is exactly. It has resemblances to some other species, but we need more evidence. And if there's any doubt, this is what a chimpanzee maxilla looks like. It's long and narrow, like Australopithecus long from the front to the back, narrow. Ours is very wide at side to side, short from front to back, and it's highly domed. These are flat, flat, as you can see. And ours has a very different shape arch from something like chimps or Australopithecus. Uh, so this was a major discovery. And now we come to the point where we talk about you know, why is it so important to go and look for more and more and more fossils? We want to understand the relationship between these fossils. We want to understand the biology of a species. We know that Afarensis has a large level of sexual dimorphism. What does that mean? Why, what are some explanations for that? Why, is it, why has that been reduced over time? And so on. So in 1978, I participated in a uh, international symposium in Sweden and uh, announced Lucy as a new species. And uh, let's see, is this right? Yeah. And what we know is that Afarensis 
was probably an ancestor to, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I've got those slides mixed up, but that doesn't matter. Um, that uh, I predicted at that time that Lucy's species, Alparensis, was an ancestor to Homo and an ancestor to that big skull you saw from Olduvai. And uh, subsequent to that, fossils have been found between those, this one, which is like Alparensis in the face, but in the back of the skull like Boise eye. So that's an important link between Alpharensis and Boise eye. Another species that has been found back in 97 has an Alpharensis face, but very large, enormous teeth like these. This was another lineage. And then the lineage that led to Homo was, we found this um, 2.4 million year old upper jaw in 1994. So that helped to substantiate my earlier hypothesis. And that homo jaw was found by uh, another one of the Institute scientists, Kay Reed, uh, when she was working at this site, which is known as Lady Gararu, which is about 20, 25 miles northeast of where Lucy was found. And uh, this was a site I first explored in 1972 and she looked in my field notes and said, boy, a lot of interesting fossils there. Maybe I'll go there and look. And uh, one of our doctoral students, uh, Chalachu, an Ethiopian who's just defended his PhD and is now uh, teaching anatomy at the University of, uh, of Missouri, uh, was the one who found this fragment of jaw. This is the fragment of jaw right here. It's a left half of a lower jaw. This is the outside of the jaw the inside of the jaw, the top and the bottom. It's 2.8 million years old. And what's important about this jaw is that the way that it's configured in the front and the outline of what that front looks like is very much like Afarensis. But in the back portion of the skull, it's very much like Homo. So it's intermediate between Afarensis and later Homo and has been placed into the genus Homo, as you can see right here. And uh, that's another link along that branch. Because when I first suggested this, and there were no fossils here, there was over a million year gap between Alpharensis and these later fossils. So over time, this hypothesis has been tested. So today, these are the potential lineages which we have reconstructed on the basis of these new discoveries. And recently a complete skull of this species, Anamensis, was announced by another Ethiopian scholar who has my old job at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And it appears that there is a fairly continuous record now of evolution actually allowing us to look at lineages which is really, to me, uh, very exciting. And who plays the central role to this, to a very large extent, is Lucy species Afarensis. Now, looking back to 1970, the first year I went to Africa and worked on an expedition, and when I could begin to call myself a paleoanthropologist, this is what the fossil record looked like, right? You had Africanus and Robustus and Boisei. You had Homo habilis, Erectus, Heidelbergensis, that's the Heidelberg jaw, Neanderthals and Sapiens. Today, the family tree has become more species rich. And what is singularly important about this and revealing to us is that if you take a line through about 2 million years, you have one, and now we have Homo erectus, two, three, four, five, six at least species living at the same time as, uh, that belong on the hominin fossil tree. It's amazing. You, we now have broken uh, the four million year time barrier with the discovery of Anamensis, which we think is a direct ancestor to Afarensis. 
And there are some, and these I would call Australopithecus, the orange are the robust ones, the big ones with the crest and the massive teeth, and other ones which are non-robust like Africanus, Afarensis, Animensis, uh, and so on. Uh, and there are a group of pre-Australopithecus fossils that were unknown until more recently. Uh, one of them is uh, Ramidus, which is Artie, which was discovered by uh, Tim White's team in the middle Awash. Uh, and uh, perhaps another species directly ancestral to that called Artipithecus cadaba, and a couple of others, one specimen from Chad, um, although they think it had this sort of lifespan, they have a couple of specimens now. And um, one from uh, Kenya known as Aurora tugenensis, which has thigh bones associated with it, which is probably the oldest evidence of upright bipedalism and locomotion. So it, you know, so often in life, as we all know, to be in the right place at the right time is almost more important than anything else. I was in the right place. I came in at the beginning of what I like to call the golden decade between the 1970 and 1980, when paleoanthropology, paleoanthropological discoveries just exploded. And at a time when people were beginning to focus more on Ethiopia than on Kenya and Tanzania. And when we look at Ethiopia's contributions from 6 million years through these various species and so on that I talked about, and I didn't really stress that the 2.8 million year old jaw that was found by Kay Reed's team is associated with stone tools. So not only is it the oldest evidence for our own genus, Homo, it's also the oldest evidence for the association of Homo with stone tools. So we're beginning to get a pretty interesting, deeper understanding of hominid evolution. We see that one of the early things that happened was canine reduction. What did that reflect? Did that reflect a change in diet? Did it reflect a change in behavior? Was there less competition for males for females? Uh, why did that all happen? And then we saw the advent of bipedalism. I haven't put any dates on these, but this is the sequence of events that creatures began to stand up. Was it for provisioning, to carry food back to a home base, to support its mate? and maybe offspring to assure that those genes were passed on uh, to again, uh, enlarged teeth, uh, such as an anamensis and afarensis, and these are cheek teeth, not canines. Was this a shift in diet? We see that the shift in diet was beginning already, probably around the time of anamensis. And maybe that was because they were incorporating a new, tougher kind of food into the diets. We know from studies of trace um, elements, isotopes in teeth, that when we look at things uh, like afarensis and uh, particularly things in here, the robust, they're eating a lot of grass. And that takes, you have to eat a lot of grass, right? That's, that's not good for growing brains. You've never seen a horse or well, maybe a horse, but you've never seen a, a cow roll over or sit up. I mean, they're, they spend all their time eating, you know, but with the advent of, of meat in the diet, you had some, a high energy food for the growth of brains. So you had dietary specializations in these groups. So they were highly adapted and they died out about a million years ago. Then teeth reduced again in size. Uh, and that was correlated probably with the uh, beginning of scavenging and the beginning of hunting associated with encephalization, the brains were beginning to grow. We now know that happened much earlier and we're trying to figure out why is it 20% bigger way back then with afarensis? Well, I think it might have more to do with behavior and what they were doing with each other and what kinds of groups they were living in. We know that among primates, that those that live in groups and those that have complicated social structures do have on average larger brains. 
And then ultimately you had very specific cranial facial specializations that led to Neanderthals with those long skulls and the very projecting faces reflecting the, the large maxillary sinuses and their adaptations to a cold environment. So I've divided these into pre-homo and into homo groups. Now, how does all this fit together? Well, this is what we see almost weekly in the New Yorker or whatever, uh, this inexorable march through time from ape to angel, who always happens to be a white European male. Uh, but uh, that's because white European males, I think, draw these. Um, but we know that the one illustration in Darwin, the only illustration in the origin of species is a family tree. It's, it's just a family tree. It isn't the family tree of any group. It just is what he suggested was there must be branching of evolution, enduring evolution. There isn't just a straight line from A to B. So if we look at that, we see that while there are many new species on here, it appears that Afarensis was in the right place at the right time. That this was the highly generalized species, the highly adaptable species that gave rise to creatures that ultimately evolved into us. And of course, every paleoanthropologist has their own tree. Looks like a forest now, and it's hard to choose which tree is correct. But we know at least that it was ancestral to the groundwork that led to brain expansion, tool use, cumulative culture, syntactic language, and so on that we see expressed in ourselves, homo sapiens, and yet was also an ancestor to a whole series of species here that ultimately died out because they became much too specialized. So to conclude, for me, I would say now 77 years old, living long enough to see a hypothesis that, that I suggested in 1978 be tested over and over and be at least supported and bolstered by the evolution, by the discovery of new fossils that help substantiate that is unique. I was very fortunate as a young scholar to make that discovery and working with people and putting together a hypothesis that has been tested over and over again. And where we go now as a species is pretty much up to us. Uh, the one thing that will be a large talking point uh, when we move into this building with our colleagues is, you know, where do we go from here? And uh, I'm sure many of you have watched uh, uh, my friend David Attenborough's recent um, Netflix uh, program. He's probably more hopeful than I am about the future of this planet or the future of ourselves, uh, because we seem to be a species that is slowly committing suicide uh, by just taking away everything we possibly can from our creator. And in my sense, I'm talking about nature. Nature can only take so much before it begins to crumble and before its gift to us begins to be eroded away. And I think that a perception and an understanding of, of how we fit into the natural world, as Huxley said, man's place in nature, my autobiography I'm working on now and my working title is My Place in Nature. And I think it's very important that the species become much more introspective about who we are, what influence we have and, and where we're going. And hopefully we will leave descendants who will someday look back on us with a smile on their face rather than with anger. And with that, I'll, I'll just leave this and uh, stop sharing and we'll get back to perhaps where we can uh, try to entertain some questions. Thank you so much, Donald. That was an amazing presentation and uh, doing these different speaker series. I've just always been amazed at the uh, passion and the, the uh, you know, so many amazing people who sort of living their passion, I guess is what I want to say. So it's, it's outstanding to have you with us. So as a reminder, um, please uh, pose your questions through chat 
and then we'll bring you on and I will um, start working on this. So Don, real quick while I uh, get our first question going, could, could you talk to us a bit about when you have the first evidence of tools being used? The question of uh, when did we first see uh, fashioned tools in the fossil record? Uh, of course, things like wooden tools and so forth would, would not be preserved. But when do we see purp purposely made stone tools? Uh, I would say at 2.8 million. Uh, there are tools uh, that go back to almost 3.3 or 3.4 million that are found at Lake Turkana, very large blocks of rock uh, that I'm not so certain they were sitting trying to make a particular flake to be used as at 2.1, 2.8 million years, that these were maybe tools that were used more for bashing. Uh, and it's interesting if we look at our closest uh, living relative, uh, chimpanzees. Uh, back in, even in, back in Darwin's time, everyone thinks this is uh, something that's only recently been recognized, but Portuguese sailors going up the west coast of Africa reported in their travel logs and so on that they saw these, these primitive humans, which were really chimpanzees, uh, that they were using a stone to break open a nut. And we know from uh, much more detailed work now that uh, they do this on a regular basis in West Africa. They don't do it in East Africa. That if they can't get into one of these hard shelled nuts, if they can't bite through it, they will use a, an anvil, which would be a, a stone and another stone to crack it open to eat that kernel of, of that seed and uh, of that nut, I should say. So it seems to me that that could have been the aha or genius moment with some early hominid that happened to put that together when he or she struck the nut and a flake came off and it cut her, his or her finger and they went, aha, uh -huh. hmm, wow. Maybe, who knows? Maybe that was the birth of tool making. The other possibility of earliest stone tools comes from uh, the, art, the paleontological site just across the river from Hadar, which is called Dikika, where uh, my friend Zarai, uh, who, whose team found this 3.3 uh, million year old baby skull, the kind of baby Lucy would have, found a couple of bones with what appear to uh, a number of people, not only Zarai, but also Curtis Marion, who's at the Institute uh, uh, in, um, at ASU. He works in Southern um, Africa on the emergence of modern human behavior. And he thinks those are genuine cut marks made by a purposeful flake that someone was using to perhaps deflesh or scavenge a kill. And those are close to three, those are around 3.4 million years. The problem with that is that there are other agencies. They could have been trampled upon, they could have been transported in a river that had uh, two uh, stones in it that could have left similar marks. Uh, we don't know. It's only this one occasion, one instance, it's just barely opened the window. Uh, and also there have been unfortunately no, no stone tools found associated anywhere at that time horizon, either at Hadar or at Dakika. So I would say that the, that the definitive firmest evidence we have is at about 2.8 million uh, at uh, Lady Guraru with that mandible. Now that doesn't mean that's the first occurrence. Uh, it may have an earlier occurrence. And it's the time now between when Afarensis disappears in the fossil record and presumably evolves into early Homo and the appearance of early Homo that we need to intensify our efforts and see if we find good evidence of, of stone tool use. Thank you so much.
So our first question, it's only fitting, I think, comes from Jesse Fry, who helped organize this talk. Jesse, if you'd like to unmute yourself, and uh, thank you for helping organize it. I love dogs, so all right, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, what was the first critter to create fire, and when was that? What was the first critter to uh, invent fire? Well, um, you know, fire has an incredibly important impact on uh, so much of what we do. And if, if one even just thinks back to the time of our earliest ancestors, and let's go back to Lizzie's time, when it got dark, it got dark. Uh, and there was much they could do about it. Uh, maybe there was some moonlight, uh, maybe there was some starlight, but basically it was dark. And fire had an incredible effect on processing food, certainly. It had an incredible effect on, on uh, how people interacted with one another. Uh, they didn't probably, you know, go to bed with sundown and get up with sunrise. Uh, they sat around a fire and they exchanged stories and um, it changed the whole way they looked at, at the world. There is um, evidence uh, from Swartkrans in Southern Africa, which is over uh, around 2 million years in age, that uh, my friend uh, Bob Brain sees a repetitive appearance of fire and suspects that they, they had a way of, of making or harnessing fire. Uh, I suspect that... Uh, some of the earliest uses of fire uh, were a result of a lightning strike and a lightning strike from which they could for part of the time uh, use that fire as long as they kept it lit. Uh, but certainly um, by a half a million years ago, they were clearly, maybe a million years ago, they were clearly making and using fire, I think on a fairly regular basis. Uh, and once that invention uh, was, came about and they learned that striking rocks together and producing sparks, uh, maybe it was late in the afternoon when someone was making a stone tool and they saw that the, there was these, they, you know, these sparks. And I don't know what they called them, but they saw that there was something happening and maybe it caught fire to something or other caught something on fire. So um, there are people looking at this uh, and there are claims that go back much further, but again, it's difficult to understand if they were really making the fire or harnessing the fire. Um, and it's still, it is a question that many people are looking at. Next question is Marilyn Paolo. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Marilyn. Yes. Can you hear me? You are on. I can hear you, Marilyn. Yes. I, w I noticed in the skulls and in the pictures of um, apes and chimpanzees and humans, humans have huge noses. Now, did our nose get bigger or did the jaw shrink such that it made our nose look bigger? And what's a nose used for except for breathing? Why couldn't we have little noses? Well, it's true. You're absolutely right that uh, by the time uh, people have looked at this anatomy and think that by the time of, of Homo erectus that we had a much more projecting nose and that it had, it had partly to do with the reduction of the face, uh, this part of the face, and also the growth of the nose inside of which are these turbinels that are very rich in vascular supply and serve to help moisten air as well as to cool air, so that it was it was probably partly associated with thermal regulation. Uh, when uh, creatures left um, the more forested areas to the more open areas, you know, you have exceptions like when I was in Borneo and saw proboscis monkeys. Uh, I think that their large noses were in part uh, a sexual signaling. Uh, device or attractive device, uh, but it, it probably has something to do with thermal regulation. Our next question is from John Peacock. John, if you'd like to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes. 
Um, I, I'll just read my question. Uh, how can you determine uh, now the amount of hair on the body, the color of the skin, or the shape of the nose without the, the uh, soft tissue being present? Well, the shape of the nose um, leaves certain marks, uh, mus muscular marks, uh, and a certain anatomy to the nasal region that people like John Gurchy and uh, my friend Maurice Anton have seen in dissecting, so they know if they're there or not. But hair and color of skin, of course, are something that is uh, very much up to the, um, the artists who, who do this, particularly hair. But if you think about it, many chimps, when you get down to their skin, are very dark, very light skinned. So maybe that light skin is, is okay in the forest, but uh, out, in the, out in the grasslands where you have such intense sunlight, it serves darker skin, serves as protection from the sun damaging rays of the sun and their selection for um, more highly pigmented skin. And also I think that uh, moving out of the forest into more open grasslands is associated again with an aspect of thermal regulation, which means that when we uh, stand up uh, and have really developed this eccrine sweat gland system, uh, we wanna have as much skin exposed to uh, evaporation as a cooling process than uh, in, in the forests. Our next question is Ann Story from Ann Story. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Ann. There you go. So my question is, chimpanzees and gorilla males don't provision females and young, but human males often do. So when do you think this change from not provisioning to more family units happened? Well, you know, if you if you read uh, Owen Lovejoy, um, a anthropologist at Kent State University, uh, he really believes that um, early hominids, e hominids even at at Lucy's, and he's even suggested even at at Ramidus's, uh, Artipithecus's stage, that uh, that bonding was beginning. Um, you, the one thing, and, and what sharing food and bringing back to a home base does is it ensures the, survivor, the survivability of the offspring. It reduces the chances of, um, uh, of danger for females who don't have to wander very far. And uh, he suggests uh, that uh, th this may have happened very early and uh, suggests that monogamy uh, can actually stretch much further back in time uh, than, than most people think. Um, yes, male uh, gorillas do not provision their offspring. Uh, and why would you provision your offspring if you didn't know they were your offspring? Uh, if there was monogamy and pair bonding and you had consistent consensual reproductive events, uh, you would be assured that they were your offspring and you would be encouraged to support them. Um, at, at, whereas in gorillas and chimpanzees, for example, the only um, parent that's really known is the female. The, no male knows that's his infant and no infant knows that that's the male that gave him his or her Y chromosome. So uh, X chromosome, Y chromosome, so um, X or Y chromosome. So uh, it, 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 that's a very difficult question to answer, uh, but it may be, it is part of a larger explanation that Lovejoy gives for upright bipedal locomotion, that upright walking and the ability to free the upper limbs from locomotor needs allowed them to be used to carry larger amounts of food back to a home base and, and share it. And there's a long chapter in my first book, uh, Lucy, I don't know if you've read that, but there's a long chapter on it that explains it in much more detail. 
And by the way, there is now an audio version of that book, which I narrate that became available last summer. Um, and you might want to pursue looking at, at that in terms of uh, provisioning. Our next question is Leslie Ozawa. Le Leslie, if you want to unmute yourself, and you may have one or two questions I know you had, but choose, choose which one you'd like. Uh, yeah, my first question is about if you have any thoughts about the, uh, I guess, the hypothesis of Gaia, the James Lovelock, um, the interaction between the, I guess, basically the physical uh, geography and um, the biology. And the second question was about any changes in the anatomy that indicates the development of speech. So maybe some idea about when speech occurred? Well, uh, I'll answer the, the first question um, about Gaia. Uh, one of my real heroes, and there's a picture up on the wall of him just up there in that oval frame, uh, is Alexander von Humboldt. And Humboldt uh, was also a childhood discovery for me. Uh, he was an, ex was an explorer um, who was Prussian. Uh, he came to the New World in, you know, 1801. He spent five years in South America. He wrote 30 volumes on South America, on butterflies, on birds, on geology, on earthquakes, on et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he was a, he was known by literally everybody in the United States today few people are familiar with Alexander von Humboldt, in spite of the fact that on the 100th anniversary of his birth, the New York Times celebration was an entire front page of the New York Times devoted only to Alexander von Humboldt. And um, he wrote, never finished, but five volumes of a book that was precipitated by all of his field work and his deep thinking about the natural world, uh, which he called the cosmos, trying to talk about and explain and understand the interactions of everything in what was known about the universe. Pretty big undertaking. Uh, and he almost called that book Gaia. Uh, and what he meant by that, and I'm, I'm not uh, terribly familiar with the, with the uh, is it Lovelock's um, Gaia hypothesis? But what I am familiar with is that um, all of life on the planet is interconnected. All of, and with, with other life, as well as with natural phenomena like earthquakes, um, asteroids, the dinosaurs certainly knew about that, and um, natural processes. And there is this, um, as David Attenborough alludes to in his recent Netflix um, documentary, that everything is interconnected. And once we begin to disturb any part of it, a result is felt in something else. It's sort of like a, a huge interconnected web, like an enormous spider web is how I look at it. That wherever you touch that spider web, there's a reaction in some other part of that spider web. And we may not understand all of those connections, but we are now beginning to understand that climate change, yes, is partly in at some times due simply to astronomical situations or whatever, but that we have so speeded up this process that we are preventing the natural world from coming back to some sort of equilibrium. Uh, so I think it is very important to, to stress that humans are not, as early anthropologists uh, considered ourselves, super organic. We are not beyond biology. We are part of the biological world and that what we do matters. And we see this happening over and over with hurricanes and storms and fires in California and so on and so forth. 
and people are taking a really close look at, at the interconnectedness of what I think was implied in with Gaia and with what Alexander von Humboldt stressed so much in his books, especially a book which was uh, translated called Aspects of Nature, which is a, a wonderful book, a very popular book in England at the time. Um, and the, I forgot the other part of the question. It's about speech and- uh... Ah, speech. Well, uh, you know, we can only look at proxies for speech. We, uh, we wish, I wish, one of the things that I'm very fascinated in and that I've been fascinated in since the early 80s, when I first went to Southwest France, uh, are, the, are these incredible rock paintings. And, uh, you know, those people were, those people were co colloquially called uh, Cro-Magnons, but th they had speech. They had articulate, symbolic speech. They sat around and spoke about things the way we speak about things in a symbolic way. As we go back in time and you look at things like um, the amount of effort and, and, and understanding and communication it takes to build a bow and arrow, for example, at 160,000 years ago, uh, these people had speech. So we have to look at the archeological record and by proxy, meaning the paintings in Europe and things like very complex tools, like um, heat treatment for let's say silcrete in some of these South African sites, it goes back to 160,000 years. This was an engineering breakthrough. And this couldn't have been brought about by using simply imitation. This had, to, this had to use a level of communication that, would, uh, that could be as nuanced as a, a symbolic language. Chimps, yes, they have communication. It's essentially situational, you know, oh, food, oh, danger, you know, but they don't ever sit around and use symbolic thinking. I don't think that uh, I, I could see some of the stone tools that were made called the old one, I don't think there was probably a great deal of symbolic language that it took to make those. But when you get to more sophisticated tools and complex tools, uh, there, there, there certainly was language, but I'm far from an expert on language. Um, we know that this is hardwired in our brains, that it came about through natural selection the same way as other parts of our body did. And um, Steven Pinker at, at Harvard, a good friend of mine wrote a book called The Language Instinct in which he talks a great deal about this. Uh, but uh, unfortunately we don't have any paleo recordings to know exactly when. But with language, we made that final absolute leap across a huge chasm between all other mammals and ourselves. So why don't we take a couple of more questions and then... Uh, yeah, I was just going to double check because we are a few minutes over time, but if you'd be happy to take a couple more, that would be great. Our, our next one is uh, Bob Schaefer. If you'd unmute yourself, Bob. There we go. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, if you could discuss some of the human evolutionary bottlenecks. There, depending upon the literature you get into, there's either been one or 20 over for the most recent, a few thousand years ago, some going back hundreds of thousands of years. But we have relatively low DNA diversity. And uh, a lot of that is attributed to some of these bottlenecks and close extinction events. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I couldn't have said it any better than you did. Uh, that uh, like all other creatures, uh, we have gone through bottlenecks. And uh, if something like coronavirus developed uh, 50,000 years ago, we might not be here today. Uh, I think we would be for a whole series of reasons, as you can well imagine. Uh, we are a totally interconnected species worldwide now, so 
you get on a plane with COVID and could mean Beijing and you spread it very easily during hunter gatherer times. Uh, people were separated into hunter gatherer groups and uh, a group of hunter gatherers in Tucson get sick and they all die. Very unlikely that the hunter gatherer group in Payson, Arizona is going to get that and die out. But when we look at the level of diversity of DNA in our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, it's enormous. Even within a troop, they have a high level of genetic diversity, which suggests that they did not go through these incredible bottlenecks that we did. And there are, and you, you're speaking mostly, Bob, about the uh, genetic literature that talks about these bottlenecks and reducing populations to uh, relatively small sizes and uh, making it through that bottleneck and becoming the next founder uh, population. Uh, I don't think we would, we would see that happening today unless there was a, a major nuclear war where there were only very small groups of people highly isolated from one another that became the founders of um, subsequent new kind of human being. Mm. Well, I think that that's a, probably a great stopping point for us. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your time and for this amazing presentation. And, and as I was telling him earlier, uh, you make me feel so much younger when we're talking about species <laughs> millions of years old. So I appreciate that too. But uh, it's uh, been an honor to have you and uh, be with you today. And I, the thing I always say is that you, the bad part about these webinars is you don't get to hear the thunderous applause of everybody behind the scenes, but yeah. um, know that it's greatly appreciated and we'd welcome you back anytime because I, I think we could have done questions for two more hours. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And um... In that vein, I would simply close by thanking all of you who signed up for this. I hope that uh, you have a little better understanding of the kind of work that I've been doing and some of the ideas and thoughts I have about the human condition. And um, I know there are other colleagues uh, at IHO who are uh, doing in incredibly interesting work in uh, places like Tanzania, Southern Africa, or Kenya. And um, hopefully uh, you'll meet one or two of them in the future. So thank you very much indeed. And I wish you great success with your fundraising campaign and um, salute all of you who uh, just don't want to stop learning. What a perfect way to end. Well, thank you so much again, Donald. And uh, we hope we'll get to see you and your colleagues here again soon. Okay. Take care and thank you everybody. Have a great week at Ollie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.